Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to my oral medicine series. I'm really excited about this section because it's going to focus exclusively on the case questions, and it'll provide updated information on things like antibiotic prophylaxis, and also fill in some gaps that my pharmacology series didn't cover, like bisphosphonates. Now my goal with this high yield section is to empower you to look at a patient box, analyze a medical history, recognize key words, and then be able to recite a list of things that should be considered to help manage that case appropriately. So if you see a dental patient on warfarin, you wanna know their INR, if they're taking corticosteroids, how much have they taken and are we concerned about adrenal crisis? If they have hypertension, what blood pressure can we operate with? If they have diabetes, what blood sugar level do we want them at? These are just some of the many examples of everything that we'll go over in this series together. So we'll start with antibiotic prophylaxis. This is a big, important topic, and I've compiled the newest recommendations and simplified them in this handy chart. Now compared with previous recommendations, there are currently very few patients where antibiotic prophylaxis may be indicated prior to certain dental procedures. And we'll talk about what those dental procedures are in a future slide. And remember, antibiotic prophylaxis is a proactive measure to prevent serious infection. And the one we're most concerned about is infective endocarditis which is infection of the inner layer of the heart, usually the valves. So obviously that's important, but why is it a concern in dentistry? Well, bacteria found in the mouth, like Streptococcus sanguinis, can actually enter the bloodstream during certain procedures and can technically get to the heart, but the risk of that is very, very low. So again, current guidelines support premedication for a relatively small subset of at-risk patients. And this is based on scientific evidence, which shows that the risk of adverse reaction to antibiotics and the development of drug-resistant bacterial strains generally outweighs the benefit of protecting against infective endocarditis, except for these at-risk patients in the left column with some underlying heart condition that makes them just more prone to infective endocarditis. So let's go through this yes column to start with. So we want to have antibiotic coverage for someone with a history of infective endocarditis. This person has obviously shown they're at risk because they already had it before. Someone with a prosthetic heart valve, including transcatheter implanted prostheses and homographs, or a prosthetic material used for a cardiac valve repair, such as annuloplasty rings and cords, should also have coverage. Also, someone that had a cardiac transplant with valve regurgitation, this means leaking heart valve, due to a structurally abnormal valve. And note that this does not say an otherwise normal heart with valve regurgitation, but specifically a transplanted heart with this. And then lastly, there's a specific list of congenital, which means present from birth, heart diseases or defects. And this includes unrepaired cyanotic heart defects or not fully repaired cyanotic heart defects, including palliative shunts and conduits that are just used for a temporary stabilization. Also on this list are any repaired congenital heart defects with residual shunts or leaking valves at the site of or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch or a prosthetic device. So important to define here is this word cyanotic. So cyanotic heart disease results in a low blood oxygen level. Cyanosis refers to a bluish color of the skin and mucous membranes. And you might be asking, well, what are some specific examples of this? Well, we'll unpack it more in this next slide. So congenital heart defects may lead to the formation of pathological connections called shunts between the right 
and the left heart chambers, allowing blood to flow along a pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure. Cyanotic defects involve a right to left shunt, where the blood flows from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart via a pathological connection. So deoxygenated blood enters the systemic circulation, resulting in cyanosis. Now, the examples of this would be tetralogy of phallet, truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, tricuspid atresia, and total anomalous pulmonary vascular return. How I remember this is all five of these start with the letter T. So the five T's are all cyanotic. The acyanotic defects involve a left to right shunt, where oxygenated blood from the lungs is shunted back into the pulmonary circulation. So there's no cyanosis to worry about here, and these are, at least relative to the cyanotic category, less severe. Hence why we don't premedicate for this column. So some examples of acyanotic congenital heart defects are atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, patent ductus arteriosus, and coarctation of the, of the aorta. And all of these can be shortened to three letters. So that's how I remember this column of heart defects. So anyway, with that background, let's go back to the previous slide. So now we can go to the no column over here. Generally speaking, patients with uh, hip replacement, shoulder replacement, any other joint replacement do not need antibiotics before dental procedures. However, for patients with a history of complications associated with their joint replacement surgery, which is very slim, who are undergoing invasive dental procedures, prophylactic antibiotics may only be considered after consultation with both the patient and the orthopedic surgeon who did that joint replacement surgery. And in those extremely rare cases, the orthopedic surgeon would recommend the appropriate antibiotic regimen and when possible, write the prescription. Now I've also seen a lot of confusion around this second row, mitral valve prolapse. So the newest American Heart Association guidelines specifically state that antibiotics are no longer recommended for mitral valve prolapse with or without regurgitation or thickened valve leaflets. And even though mitral valve prolapse is the most common underlying condition that increases risk for infective endocarditis in the United States, the incidence of it is still so low that antibiotics just are not worth the risk. So what else do we have in this no column? Well, rheumatic heart disease is, is no longer indicated for antibiotic coverage. This is where the heart has been permanently damaged by rheumatic fever. Bicuspid valve disease, where the aortic valve has two cusps or leaflets instead of three like it usually does. Uh, calcific aortic stenosis, this is where a calcium deposits form on the aortic valve. And then all of the other congenital heart conditions that we didn't talk about in the left column. So essentially all of the acyanotic ones are the ones that don't need antibiotics. Atrial septal defect, all the ones we talked about in this slide on the right. So this is really important because ASD and VSD are actually the most common congenital heart defects that you'll see, and you don't need antibiotics for them. Now, as far as uh, pediatric patients are concerned, these same rules apply with just one addition, and that's a congenital heart defect that's been completely repaired with a prosthetic material or a device. Antibiotics are recommended for the first six months after that repair procedure. Now we do have a couple of other considerations. And with the exception of the guidelines we just talked about, there are no other general recommendations to provide antibiotics before any dental procedure. 
And those are the only official guidelines. Anything else is a bit of a gray area. There may be specific individuals with extenuating circumstances where the determination and prescription is made by the patient's surgeon or some other treating physician. So the bad news is that these extenuating circumstances are a gray area. But the good news is I compiled the most common ones here and the board exam won't test you on anything that I haven't covered in this video. So first, I want to be clear. This first row shows the dental procedures that I alluded to earlier on in this video. So if we have a patient in the yes column and they're undergoing one of these dental procedures, that is when we're going to prescribe antibiotics. So the dental procedures that are eligible would be anything that involves manipulation of the gingival tissue or periapical region or perforation of the oral mucosa. I've listed out some examples, extraction obviously, a cleaning if we're manipulating the gums, SRP, scaling and root planing, fitting orthodontic bands, placing temporary anchorage devices, biopsy, sutures, uh, periapical microsurgery, any of those would be examples of dental procedures that would qualify for antibiotic prophylaxis if the patient is already in, in that yes column somewhere. So examples of dental procedures that do not require antibiotics, even if you have a patient in the yes column, would be routine anesthetic injections through non-infected tissue, taking dental radiographs, uh, placing removable prosthodontic or orthodontic appliances, adjusting orthodontic appliances, placing orthodontic brackets, shedding deciduous teeth, and even bleeding from trauma to the lips or oral mucosa. Now in terms of the myriad of other conditions where antibiotic prophylaxis can be considered, they revolve around a body that has trouble defending itself against infection, generally someone who is severely immunocompromised. So immunosuppression could be secondary to a human immunodeficiency virus or AIDS, a hematopoietic stem cell or solid organ transplantation. Uh, someone could have neutropenia, which is usually related to uh, undergoing cancer treatment, so cancer chemotherapy or a history of head and neck radiotherapy. Someone with rheumatoid arthritis with biological response modifiers or they're taking uh, prednisone more than 10 milligrams per day. Someone with severe combined immunodeficiency and then some autoimmune diseases like juvenile idiopathic arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. We also have some uh, consideration for hyperglycemic states. So this would be someone with uncontrolled diabetes may also have some amount of immunosuppression. This would be signaled by an HbA1c level of greater than 8% or a random blood glucose reading of over 200 milligrams per deciliter. So here are the generic prescriptions for prophylaxis, and this is from my pharmacology series with one addition in red. So our first choice is generally amoxicillin, two grams. We would ask the patient to take four 500 milligram tablets one hour before dental treatment. For children, that dose goes down to 50 milligrams per kilogram, otherwise same timetable. So azithromycin is the big change since last time because there are actually growing concerns about Clostridium difficile infection that has been known to happen with clindamycin, wiping out the normal gut flora, allowing that opportunistic infection to take place in the colon. So anyway, azithromycin is another alternative to someone who is allergic to penicillin, and perhaps the preferable alternative to clindamycin, which used to be just the go-to for someone with penicillin allergy. So azithromycin, we would prescribe 500 milligrams one hour before treatment for adults, 15 milligrams per kilogram for children. Now clindamycin is still uh, eligible for antibiotic prophylaxis, still can be used, 600 milligrams for adults, 20 milligrams per kilogram for children. And then we still have ampicillin, which is uh, an option for someone who cannot take 
oral medication, you deliver this intravascularly or intramuscularly, two grams, 30 minutes before treatment. For children, that becomes 50 milligrams per kilogram. And a nice shortcut to remember pediatric dosing is to divide the adult dose by either 30 or 40. So 2 grams, which is 2,000 milligrams, divided by 40 gets you to 50 milligrams per kilogram. And the same is true for ampicillin. Now for clindamycin, 600 milligrams divided by 30 gets you to 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then for azithromycin, you divide somewhere between 30 and 40, I think it's 33 and a third, to get you to 15. So a nice quick little shortcut if you have trouble remembering the pediatric dosing to divide by somewhere between 30 and 40 to get that uh, correct dose. So to finish up, I came up with some scenarios covering some frequently asked questions to tie up any loose ends on this concept and topic of antibiotic prophylaxis. So for instance, what if the patient forgets to take their antibiotic before the procedure? More common than you might think. So let's say they have a history of infective endocarditis and they have an urgent extraction that needs to be done today. So what do you do? Well, your first thought might be, well, we have no choice but to reschedule them, or let's just take it out anyway, or at least push the appointment back a few hours to give them time to take it. So actually, you can have them take the antibiotic up to two hours after the procedure. So there's actually no need to reschedule the patient in that first scenario. Now for number two, I get asked this one all the time. What if a patient is taking amoxicillin for some other conditions, strep throat, let's say, but they also need an antibiotic for prophylactic coverage. Let's say they have a prosthetic heart valve. What do you do in that scenario? Perhaps you don't have to prescribe anything because they're already taking amoxicillin. Do you tell them to double up the dose? Do you stop that one and give them a new one? Well, actually, the dentist should select an antibiotic from a different class than the one the patient is already taking. So if they're already taking amoxicillin, you could prescribe azithromycin or clindamycin since they're already on amoxicillin in this case. For number three, what if the patient uh, has an indication for taking prophylactic antibiotics and they're having a filling done? So remember, procedures requiring prophylaxis are those that involve manipulation of gingival tissue or the periapical region of teeth or perforation of the oral mucosa. So they're not required though for routine anesthetic injections, for radiographs if we needed to take some, and if it's a straightforward occlusal restoration and uh, we're not clamping a rubber dam onto their gums, we're not anticipating any subgingival curatage, then we actually don't need any antibiotics in that case. And lastly, let's say the patient's orthopedic surgeon recommends antibiotics for a replaced hip joint, but didn't prescribe them for the patient. And now the patient is calling your office and they're coming in tomorrow to get a tooth taken out. So you of course try to get in touch with the orthopedic surgeon and have them write a prescription, but they're not answering you. So what would you do in that case? Well, ideally, you'd have the orthopedic surgeon prescribe their recommended dose, but if you're in a bind, as long as you have on file what their recommended prescription is for that patient, you could yourself prescribe the antibiotic that the orthopedic surgeon recommended in the past. So here are some, uh, I think, really good things to think through some difficult scenarios, but they all have uh, clear answers within the guidelines set by the American Heart Association. So hopefully this video cleared up any doubts that you had about antibiotic coverage, and then you can confidently answer any question you see on the board exam concerning this topic. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, 
and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page, and thank you to all of my patrons here for all their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams, so go check that out. The link will be in the description below this video. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.